the CMO or the, the senior marketer, you know, has to be tied into the whole development of the strategic plan with the CFO and, and the CEO and understanding how we're going to grow the business. What choices are we going to make? Not just in terms of what we're going to do, but what aren't we going to do? Hello, and welcome to The Marketing Architects, a research-first podcast dedicated to answering your toughest marketing questions. I'm Elena Hingle. I run the marketing team here at Marketing Architects, and I'm joined by my co-host, Angela Voss, our CEO, and we have a special guest with us today, John Wojcik. John is currently Vice President, New Business and Solution Development at Brother USA. He has held a number of impressive marketing leadership roles. He spent a number of years in consumer marketing, at GlaxoSmithKline. He was global marketing director of McNeil Consumer Healthcare, a division at Johnson & Johnson, vice president and general manager at Newell Brands, chief marketing officer at Brown Jordan, and chief marketing officer at The Zebra. Thank you for joining the show, John. Thank you. I appreciate that uh, kind introduction. That's an impressive background. Well, thank you. Hopefully I can uh, live up to it. For sure you will. Uh, we're here uh, with John today to share our thoughts on some recent marketing news always trying to root our opinions in data, research, and what drives business results. We've brought John onto the show today to help us break down a topic covered frequently in marketing and advertising trade pubs, the challenging relationship CMOs and marketing teams often have with their boards and senior stakeholders. This topic was inspired by a recent Marketing Week article titled, ROI is the top effectiveness metric demanded by the C-suite. And this article summarizes data from Kantar and Marketing Week's second annual Language of Effectiveness Survey, which surveyed more than 1,300 brand-side marketers on a variety of topics, one of which being what metrics these marketers believe are important to their senior stakeholders. The main headline here is that marketers consider ROI to be the key metric senior stakeholders demand to prove marketing effectiveness. And almost half of marketers believe their company is too focused on ROI when it comes to measuring marketing effectiveness. But the article also includes a few other interesting findings, like overall, marketers reported new customer acquisition as the second most important metric behind ROI, with delivering business outcomes coming in third. Marketers also said metrics like conversion rates, brand awareness, customer retention, and customer lifetime value are important to the C-suite. And more than half of these marketers feel senior leadership understands the importance of both short-term and long-term marketing effectiveness. However, less than 10% of senior stakeholders are believed to consider brand attributes as a valuable tool to judge the success of a marketing campaign. So, John, I was really excited when you agreed to come on the show because we've wanted to cover this topic of proving marketing's value to senior stakeholders for a while. But as someone who's only worked at a marketing agency... My perspective is a bit limited, but you've led marketing at a wide variety of brands from established public companies to VC-backed startups. So I wanted to start off by asking you, in your experience, what marketing metrics have been most important to senior leadership at the brands you've worked at? No, I appreciate that. You know, I, I have worked really at a wide variety of companies, and it's certainly kind of situational and somewhat different. I would say at the top of the pyramid, no matter where I've worked, results are, are the first key thing that they expect now at a big public company that has a suite, you know, a CPG company has a suite of brands, consumption and sales, building a brand is very important. You know, when you get down to VC backed or PE backed companies that are more geared towards, you know, lower funnel performance marketing, they're very much looking at every dollar that you spend returning some significant upside. And then that gets to be the, the challenge, right? Because I don't think you can build a brand through clicks. Right. So just considering this pressure, and you just mentioned how hard it can be to both build a brand and drive performance, this might be a hard question, but how do you think about then balancing both those initiatives of, you know, the brand building initiatives and the performance initiatives? You know, it's a great question. Um, I'll kind of reflect on a position I was in as, as a CMO at a VC back company where we were trying to build a brand, but at the same time, there's a clock ticking, right? There's money in the bank and every dollar you're spending is burning. So you kind of have to be mindful that while you, you're trying to build a brand, you, you also need to drive traffic to a website that converts. And if you don't do that, 
you're no longer CMO, your, your company is no longer in business. So it's a little different. The runway is much shorter. You know, in a TPG publicly traded company, you have several quarters, years to kind of recalibrate and balance those two things. I kind of think about the situation that I'm in and the stakeholders that I have, and I kind of manage to that. Happy to delve deeper into that, but that would be the, the headline. John, what about the, when you think about the size and stage of a brand, we work with clients that are hundreds of millions in annual revenue all the way up to multi-billions. In your perspective, has senior leadership's perception of marketing and the results that marketing should be accountable for, have you seen a difference in size and stage of the brand that you've worked at? Or how do you think about that? Yeah, no, I, I do think size and scale, you know, make a difference because inherent in size and scale, scale would be uh, a successful brand. The fact that it would have scaled to that point would say that it has some equity and has, you know, some time to continue those those efforts. Now, I, I have worked on big brands where they haven't been nurtured and they were big, powerful brands. They may still be large in terms of sales but they've needed to be repositioned to a new target audience because they're no longer relevant in the same ways that they were. So again, I think you have to take a look at it. On smaller brands, I kind of think about it through the lens of those are challenger brands. They're typically going against something. Um, I think that can be really powerful when I think about brand building because I think you can build a brand through claims, through positioning by really calling out some point of differentiation that you have and I've done this in, in markets where, you know, I've repositioned a challenger brand against a much larger brand that is kind of the uh, leader. The, the tough thing is, is as brand marketers, what we're steeped in this idea of, of brand equity, it's really somewhat emotional, right? I mean, the brands that you have, maybe the brands that you're wearing right now or are in your homes, I mean, they're brands that are part of your life. You're connected to them. That takes a long time. That's not uh, a relationship you likely got into easily. So even in situations, uh, Angela, where it's a small brand, it's a challenger brand, I understand I need to dial up the performance and we need to, whether it be drive traffic, drive consumption at Walmart, because we got to keep the lights on. I, I want to do things that build the brand. And whether that be developing a, a mnemonic or brand benefit visualization or something that can come through the brand wherever it shows up. So it reinforces that. I've tried to stay true to that because that's my DNA is more brand marketing, um, but I've, I've done both. And I think there's a lot of, there's growing evidence, right? Of how both sales activation and branding work together. And I know we've been really driven by the work that the IPA has done and Ehrenberg Bass and have our own data as well to support that these work in conjunction with each other. But of course, as consumers, for most products, I would say we're either in market or, or not. You know, we joke that for a client like nuts.com, you pretty much in market all the time as we can be easily convinced to need more snacking items in our pantries. But when you think about it from a performance standpoint and accountability and managing up to management, it becomes a little more challenging for those startup brands to communicate and sell in that emphasis for why brand matters, you know, why building that long term mental availability is so important to them. Yeah. And I think it's really important to, you know, in those smaller brands and those startup brands that there's really good product market fit to begin with, that it has a right to win. I'm, uh, uh, I'm highly involved in new businesses now, and we're always thinking about what is our right to win in this market? If we got involved, why should we? How can we win? What's not being served right now? What unmet needs can we unlock that others can't? That's what creates a brand, right? It's something that delivers for you time and time again. Yeah. So then what's been your experience in terms of pitching brand or long-term channels like TV advertising into senior leadership? What advice do you have? What experiences do you have uh, that can maybe help others that are out there? Well, you, you know, the, the fortunate part, how I grew up in classic CPG brand management at GlaxoSmithKline and then j and J. I I mean, everything we did was about building our brands and we spent a lot of time and money on TV, significant. Um, so I've seen what that can do. I mean, it's, it's like a rocket ship. 
when you hit it and it all comes together, I mean, shh, you, you see it. You can see your consumption at Walmart going up the day those GRPs hit and that creative hit TV. There's no vehicle that reaches people um, more completely than, than TV. I've been in a lot of situations and in, in, in companies that either hadn't ever dabbled in TV, were scared, had and failed or think that it's something that's just not available to them because they don't have the resources for it or they don't understand it. You know, I think there are a lot of smaller brands, maybe VC backed or challenger brands that have built a beachhead. They've gotten to a certain point, but they're not growing any longer because their reach is really constrained. I mean, if you're just focused on the bottom of the funnel and capturing traffic there at a certain point, there's not going to be any more air left in the balloon. You've got to go higher up in the funnel. You've got to create demand. And there's nothing that can tell a story better than than TV. Now, again, I'll go back to something I mentioned earlier, which is that situational awareness of what situation am I in? How much time do I have? How do I position things accordingly? So I think that there are ways to get involved with TV, whether it's DRTV, performance-based connected TV, where you can start to speak to a board, a CEO, and get them comfortable that you're just not going to be throwing money out the window until it works. You know, that's that's the big concern, I think, for a lot of boards and C-suites is how do we know this is working? And when will it work? And when will it pay out? And I think that um, it's it's a question of return, right? I mean, if you think about it like an investment, you may be okay right now with a return of 15% on an investment that you made. Somebody else may want 25%. Someone else may be okay with 5%. So, you know, when you talk about ROI or ROMI, return on marketing investment, it's like, what kind of return do they want? You know, what's that trade off? Maybe we can drive more market share, more sales. And it's important for us to do that because we're scaling a business and we're okay with the, the return on our investment for marketing, not to be 150 or what, what, you know, that's when I say situationally, how I think about it, that's kind of the context. I think that even with our prospects that we talk to, you know, there's still this assumption that there's kind of two pools. Now I feel there's the folks that assume we have to put millions of dollars into television and it could be six to 12 months before we really understand how that's paying back for us, which of course is a scary place to be as a marketer making those decisions. So that's one camp, which I think we would disagree with uh, in terms of measurement because there are folks that are in market for your product or service at any given time, varying percentages, of course, in terms of your total addressable market, but there should be ways to have leading indicators of success along the way. And then I think too, due to the growth of CTV and this digital mindset, there's another camp that is really leaning into, well, maybe we only need five to $10,000 to test a channel like television. And is that fully using the channel in the most strategic way to ensure that you're seeing the full effects. So I think the balance and and the challenge that marketers and agencies have is finding that right mix of this doesn't need to be a multi-million dollar investment, but it probably shouldn't cost as much as a, a display test either. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have a very interesting business model. And I've always said this, that, you know, the access that you give people into TV, I don't know of any other agencies that are as turnkey uh, because there are a lot of costs associated with TV before you even get to spending money on TRPs. So um, I, I think that's scary to, to a lot of people. And I think that a lot of work has to be done to hone a message and a creative strategy into a piece of communication that is going to drive some behavior change in the market. And, and not a lot of people know how to do that, but to think that you could spend 10 or 15,000 on TV, and that's going to tell you whether it works or not. I think, uh, you know, really understanding where are they? Where is the business? What, what can they handle? Um, what, what is acceptable risk? What is the opportunity for that business? I mean, I'm sure you all have seen some businesses where you look at the business, you look at the addressable market, you read about their consumer target, unmet needs that they have, that this brand serves, and you're just like, wow. If we could just get behind this brand on TV, we could grow it. 
you just know it. You know, you've seen enough of this because I think as we we grow in our, our careers, it's a lot about pattern recognition, right? And you start to see these things over and over again. And then you just, you have to figure out what can this situation handle from an investment standpoint? That's just what's really interesting about what you offer is a way in for a lot of people that otherwise probably would be sitting on, this, on the sidelines. TV is the most powerful marketing channel. It's first in effectiveness, leads for trust, and is number one in driving emotion. But it's also expensive, difficult to scale, and hard to measure. So we flipped the traditional agency model on its head and created all-inclusive TV. You get one bill for media. We cover everything else you need to succeed. So say goodbye to hourly agency fees and say hello to making TV work harder than ever. Visit marketingarchitects.com to learn more. So John, you've mentioned that different brands have a different risk tolerance for a brand marketing investment and what they want to see out of it. And I would assume that the bigger the brand, the more they're going to be open to a bigger investment. However, you've mentioned that's probably not always the case because some brands that are more disruptors, they might be actually more marketing driven, right? You mentioned that some of these big brands you've gone and worked for, they've sort of been cruising on their market share and they might not have a lot of marketing driven initiatives anymore. So when you're looking for a CMO role or interviewing at a company, what do you look for? Because if you can't always tell by the size of the company, what are some good signs to you that, okay, this company, this team, they're going to be open to investments and things like brand? What's really critical to understand is what is the growth strategy? What is the uh, strategic plan for the business? What are they trying to achieve? And that vision that they talk about, is it connected with that strategic plan and it, those objectives that they're trying to reach? Do you think that that's achievable in the time frame and with the resources that you believe you're going to have at your disposal to make that happen? Because I think there's different types of CMOs. I've thought that, you know, there's a CMO who is the classic CPG kind of brand manager, kind of general manager approach classically trained. There's the creative CMO probably coming out of an agency, right? Probably from your world, um, very steeped in advertising and planning. And, and then there's the CMOs that are the performance digital type CMOs that are just focused on traffic and metrics. So I think I, I, I always wanted to understand the situation and are they looking for the right type of person, the right type of CMO? And do I fit Am I a good fit? And I think one way to understand that is, you know, if I'm going into a company, let's say uh, in senior management, there are some folks that, you know, had been at Pepsi in marketing or been at J&J or P&G or Unilever. I mean, they're we're probably going to speak the same language, right? We're going to look at things somewhat the same way. Not saying that everyone should look at the same problem the same way, but at least I would go into it believing that brand marketing is something that senior management has some level of understanding. And because there are, are people kind of cut from the same cloth, it must be critical, you know, if everything else aligns to the vision and the strategic imperatives that I just talked about, that would make me feel good when you're looking. And I've learned this in PE and, and VC back situations is there's not as much time to, to do things. And you really have to understand the funding situation. Working on a PE back company is very different than a VC. But one thing that's similar to both is just the pace would be very different than at a classic Fortune 500 public company in most cases. So John, when you find that perfect match and you're speaking the same language with senior stakeholders at a brand, what does that ideal relationship look like if we just think really practically when you're in a good spot? I think that uh, the, the CMO or the, the senior marketer, you know, has to be tied into the whole development of the strategic plan with the CFO and, and the CEO and understanding how we're going to grow the business. What choices are we going to make? Not just in terms of what we're going to do, but what aren't we going to do? Because I think that's what separates a great business from you know, a not so great business. A lot of people try to do everything, nothing gets done. Great businesses understand that there are some things we're just not going to do. Not that they're not good ideas, we, we're just not, we're not going to do it because we want to do 
a few things really well. And I think that that relationship that you can have with a CEO and, and with a board and, a, and other members of the C-suite where you're helping to craft that, because I, and again, I mean, I'm biased because I'm a, I grew up as a marketer, but I, I think that uh, when it comes to growth and understanding how to grow a business, that's what I was trained to do. And I've done it literally so many different industries, both B2B and B2C, that it excites me. Um, it's something I'm passionate about. I think it's something that I'm good at. And when I can, when I can get in there and work with others, because I, I don't have all the answers. But I think as a leader, we have to be asking all the right questions and then trying to work together, you know, collaborating to get those answers on the table. And as long as you're a part of that process, then to me, that that feels like I'm in the right spot. Right. It sounds like one thing you said about marketers or marketing needing to be focused and needing to be to have sort of a seat at the table feels really important. You're talking about marketing helping to drive growth and drive strategy. I could see how if marketing gets detached from that, you become sort of the make it pretty department or the, oh, I have this idea, that idea. But you're saying in a perfect world, marketing's really tuned in to the strategy of the business. And that helps probably helps you succeed long term. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I've been in businesses that are more sales driven where, you know, marketing and, and sometimes, you, you know, it, I've been in B2B situations where it's a long cycle to develop a marketing lead that becomes a sales lead but sales are really the ones that are closing right i mean that's in that business is pretty critical and those relationships are very critical and marketing can start to kind of get pushed down but i think even in those types of businesses having a brand and communicating what you stand for and now with the proliferation of channels that we can reach people and is, is, is really critical as well. So that's why you, you got to have a seat at the table. Right. So when you, you have that seat and you're talking to the C-suite, if you could give a marketer just one piece of advice for speaking marketing to people in the C-suite or senior stakeholders, what would that advice be? I, I think because in, in many cases, those other folks around the table, you know, because they're domain experts in, in their space, they don't know marketing, right? And you have to bring it to life for them in, in a way, you know, President Kennedy said, we're going to put a man on the moon in 10 years, right? That was a, a vision. That was something nobody knew, like, how, how are we going to do this? And um, you, we've probably all heard the stories that sometime after that, he was walking around Cape Canaveral and, and saw somebody went up to him and said, what do you do here at Cape Canaveral? And the guy was raking up leaves and he said, you know, I'm trying to get a man on the moon in 10 years. And he was like, wow, the message really got all the way through. So I say that because I think as a marketer, the, the advice I would give you or give anyone is, you know, you, you've got to instill some sort of vision and passion about what you're trying to do um, that has some energy to it, because that's what people follow, right? You know, if you're just going to have PowerPoint presentations or Google Slides, I don't think that gets anyone excited, right? They're going to look across the table they're going to look in your eyes and they're, they're going to say either I believe in this person or, or I don't. I think that's such great advice. And I think too, what we've seen in, in terms of some of the most successful marketing teams or most successful CMOs in some cases, marketing is so broad and like what an amazing department to be able to work in. We have so much influence over so many areas. Marketing influences HR and our ability to hire people. And so relating what we do to the business, right? Just being that enterprise thinker and thinking through how does this all add up and why does it matter? And how can I be most relevant to each area of the business? Because it really does have that impact. That's what we love about it, right? That's the game we play. Of course, we drive sales. That's our core job, but it's so much more than that. I think that as you work with you know senior teams and you're developing strategy, then you have to bring that to life for the organization, right? It, it's got to be a part of the culture, right? And you, you have to check in with the company. And that means everybody in the company, every quarter, every month, how are we doing? What are we achieving? What aren't we achieving? And, and, and how do we need to kind of reset and adapt? Because while we may have these great plans, there's this competitive environment and context that's changing all the time. As soon as you have a plan, it changes because there are so many things out of your control that happen, but you have to adapt to it. Um, and I think 
one of the things that marketing can do, not just externally, and I think you touched on this, Angela, I think internally, there's a lot marketing can do to help drive a culture uh, in a company. Because in the end, you know, why one company succeeds and, and another doesn't has probably much more to do with the people in that company than anything else, right? Because if the three of us come together and decide to do something and put our minds to it, we're probably going to do it. Well, John, I can see why you've been a successful CMO because you're a great storyteller. And I love that um, that message of marketing, setting the strategy and how could your marketing team come up with a, a vision that is like putting a man on the moon. I mean, what a great story to tell and um, a great goal for marketers to have to really be that voice in the organization. And um, I just love that story. I think that might be a great place for us to to wrap things up. That's it for this episode of The Marketing Architects. You can connect with us on LinkedIn. And if you find our show valuable, please leave us a rating and review. And if you want to know what the research says about some recent news, you can contact us at marketingarchitects.com slash podcast. Now go forth and build great marketing.